Are there any public comments before we begin? Is there any public? All right, let's begin. Good morning, Pastor Good morning. Matias um, and members of the board. Uh, this morning we will have three reports. Uh, instructional counsel uh, update provided by Dr. Kalambula. And then we have two reports, and we're going to have to reverse the order. Uh, I don't know if you all are aware, but we have senior day today. Yes, it's an yes. important day for our students. Sure. They're learning about co college entrance, and um, most of our staff uh, is going to be attending that event. Uh, Mr. Johnson will have to leave early, so we're asking to switch the, the order of the agenda. And we will be talking about public safety and its role in providing an environment conducive to learning. Uh, I apologize. Uh, I didn't, you have so much information. I didn't try to put it up on the internet, but Diane has handed you out information from his Get office. That. And then following that, uh, we will be um, engaging in an interview provided by Paris McMurray. It is but one sliver of the social emotional learning piece. He will make the connection, uh, Pastor Matias, that you asked for between PBIS and restorative practices. And uh, with the permission of the board, we'll come back with another presentation when Tasha, Tasha Neal rather, is available and we'll finish up on the so social social emotional, emotional learning. Mm -hmm. But this is one strategy under the umbrella of social emotional learning. Good morning, board members. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this morning, I'm here to just give a quick update on the uh, you know, instructional council. Uh, this year, I am the chair of the council this year, so I'm going to facilitate our meetings. They will be happening uh, once a month on Thursdays, and I'll be sending the, the dates to you uh, when we do those meetings. Uh, we, we've identified all the members, and the council is made up of GIA members, staff in the classroom, as well as uh, some of our exempt staff that have different sp specialities in the district, such as um, we have members from the equity and inclusion teams. We have members from the special education teams who can see a, a full lens of how we serve our students mm -hmm. in instruction. Um, just be advised that our first uh, meeting is happening on the 29th of uh, November. It's a Thursday. We are meeting from 1 to 3 p.m. at Southeast Career Pathways. That's our, our, our home base for meetings for this whole year. Excuse me, did you say that Board members are welcome, or it's it's not for the board. Well, you may come and see what we do. I know for sure on this coming that's meeting okay. we are that's, going to that's review. Fine. I, I was under the impression we weren't. Is that no. Yes, uh, specifically this is a meeting for DREA. Okay. Uh, sure. Yes. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Where they that's kind fine. Of out their business, and right. that's the role of Dr. Kalambula to okay. come and provide updates. So. Okay. That's okay. fine. Okay. I apologize. I misspoke. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, so, I always go wherever there's a meeting. If I can, I go. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so my apologies. Uh, this, this is for information that we are meeting on the 29th, okay. and I will come back and bring an update as to what we discuss and what, how things transpire at that meeting when we have it. I believe that is my update at this moment. If you have any other questions, I'm happy to take them. That's it. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Guess I'm next. You're next. Uh, good morning. And I have a, just a short, a very short presentation uh, on the work that we're doing inside of uh, uh, public safety and security. Uh, you have a, uh, provided you with just some of the, um, the, the manuals and booklets and documents that we work with uh, inside the department. Uh, we pretty, pretty ro robust uh, program that we have, uh, that we have going on. Uh, we believe we do have this moral and legal obligation to provide this reasonable level of school safety and security. And, and I know this has kind of been the topic of, uh, of many of our, our parents and our community's concern is how safe our schools are. We believe they're, they're very safe, uh, as safe as we can, we can make them. 
uh, we, we do this, uh, what we call creating and maintaining a safe school by our components of a safe school. And, and we've identified many components, which we provided you with a, uh, with a brief overview of those components. Uh, one of those, uh, one of the uh, components that uh, we'll talk about today is our, is our teen program, teaching, educating, <coughs> and mentoring. Uh, we believe that they are, there are some early indicators of dropouts for our students. Uh, of course, attendance problems. Uh, if these uh, students are failing at least a quarter of their classes, and then low reading scores. What we try to do in the public safety department is focus on these three areas, uh, connect uh, what we do in public safety to academics, and if we- I'm sorry, I'm sorry, don't bother. Could you repeat those three things again that we use? Uh, the attendance problems, attendance uh, issues, or uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, chronic absenteeism. <laughs> it just crapped yep. up. <laughs> yeah, chronic absenteeism, uh, low reading scores, uh, and then uh, kids who fail at least a quarter of their classes. Our focus is around, uh, with our team program, is around the sixth and eighth graders is where we want to get into the classroom. Those, uh, those transitional years of, uh, of learning are for young people. What we, what we found is when, uh, when there's other indicators, uh, one being parents not involved in the, ki in the kids' or children's educational journey has been a tremendous uh, setback for our young people. Uh, so, we, so we move into the team program, teaching, educating, and mentoring, very similar to a program you may know as DARE, uh, Drug Education Resistance Training. Uh, we don't uh, participate in DARE because DARE stops at about the fifth grade, and unfortunately that's when many of our kids need some uh, intense instruction. So TEAM is a program uh, uh, that was developed, the curriculum developed by Michigan State Police, uh, evaluated by Central Michigan University, have been very effective. We're in front of about 20 to 30,000 kids, so there's some per repeat performances to get to those numbers. Uh, we've been doing this program for over 10 years, and we are really seeing an impact that that program is having on our young people. We've extended our team program to Saturdays, uh, and with that Saturdays allow us to do on the third Saturday of every month, any student who's uh, suspected or who's suspended uh, on a long-term suspension or expulsion is required to come through the program prior to reinstatement. Uh, we've worked with, uh, with Paris McMurray and, and his office at the Student Services, and uh, we probably ran maybe 1,000 kids through this program over the last, uh, last 10 years, unfortunately. Uh, but the good part about that, very few repetitive suspensions or expulsions afterwards, uh, very few. Uh, two other programs that we think that make the difference, and, and uh, Mr. McMurray would talk about restorative practices, and Tasha uh, Neal's area is the social emotional learning. And her, her program, although she's not here today, and I don't want to speak for her, but talks, we hit on about five pillars of uh, social emotional learning uh, with our kids. We believe that social emotional learning, the team program, and restorative practices is the game changer for us in Grand Rapids. And we believe we, begin to, we are beginning to see a lot of traction around student conduct being reduced, suspensions being reduced when we embrace these programs. Uh, the, the other thing that, uh, that we continue to do is work with our cast teams, uh, providing professional learning, a lot of professional learning coming out of the professional uh, development office and working with that team, uh, Mary Jo uh, Coleman and her team, and uh, with our public safety. Uh, this past Saturday, over 80 teachers, none, none were paid, showed up at a training that we had at the university. And we often see high turnouts on Saturdays, uh, Saturday trainings. We do a, a public safety training every second Tuesday of every month, uh, twice a day for, for staff, and then in the evening for parents. And so we begin to get parents to come out uh, to see that what we're doing. Uh, one of the questions we heard uh, was around uh, the cameras and technology, and of course technology is absolutely one of our, uh, one of our uh, components of a safe school. Uh, we believe that cameras are used as an investigative tool, not as a preventative measure. We don't think that cameras stop anything. Uh, we believe we use it as a, a preventative measure or, or investigative tool. Uh, we believe that it would be the hardware, the heart, uh, not the hardware that changes the culture and climates of our schools. And we're working hard to continue to build relationships with young people, relationships with family. And, and we think that will be the thing that, uh, that we will do. We believe together we can, we can make huge changes in our schools when, when we work together. And so we just thank you for your support. Thank us for the superintendent's support, who have always been a, been a huge support of sco uh, safe schools in Grand Rapids. And we think, we, are, we think we're leading the pack in the state of Michigan, if not the country, when it comes to keeping our schools safe. Any, any questions? I do have a question, because last night there was quite a concern about cameras. So what is, I mean, obviously we have some cameras, but we Well, yes, we, uh, many of our, just about all of our high school and middle schools have cameras. 
Some of our elementary mm -hmm. schools have uh, a few cameras on the premises. Uh, with, the, with the gracious uh, yes vote of our voters several years ago, uh, $10 million was, was set aside for uh, security technology. We do have a plan uh, to go into all of our buildings, uh, update our card access, our cameras, uh, and, and just do a lot of work around safety and security. That's going to take uh, a minute. It's going to take a couple years to get there. Uh, secured entryways, if when we started, we have uh, five secured entryways that were completed this week. Uh, Campus Elementary, Gerald R. Ford, Martin Luther King, Cesar Chavez, and Burton Elementary have all now have secured entryways. Following behind that, we have a, a pretty robust camera installation plan uh, to replace current and install new in all of our buildings. Right. Because people don't get into any of the schools until you ring a buzzer, right? That is correct. Yeah, and then if there's a camera or someone can visually see you then before they open it. Because I know at Aberdeen, I imagine there's a camera at the entranceway because <laughs> They can't see me, so I imagine they just... Yeah, that's part of our A phone system, our air phone. Uh, the air phones allow uh, a visual to be buzzed in, but it's not recording. Uh, oh, the okay. cameras will actually just give visual? us recorded okay. uh, recorded images okay. once we install okay. cameras and retrofit some of those buildings with those okay. uh, with that equipment. Okay. That's interesting. So what we're doing now in the future when we install cameras and safety equipment like this, they will be recording so that we can go back and check to verify whatever... That is correct. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, um, it's, it's kind of, so we don't have a copy of this, right? So, um, Mr. Johnson, I'm going to ask, could you please ensure that I get a copy of the presentation yes. and mail that to the board? And then, you did not. will this be available online for people to see, or how does? So we will upload in our normal fashion. Okay. Um, is that something that the board would be able to see in terms of progress that we're making, um, reducing suspension, uh, classroom behavior, uh, you know, how that they're introduced back into the school if they, if they go back into the school and all the policies that we have around those things? Yes, we can provide that data. I think, John, when you make your report, you know, next in two weeks, I think that's something we should talk about as a committee. And present it to the yeah. board members because you know last night there were a lot of people who were quite concerned about cameras and so on and so forth being there to record things and you know just make an announcement at the board that this, these things are happening and like Mr. Johnson said you know these things don't happen overnight you know so uh, they have to be aware that changing all of these things takes time and money and uh, mm -hmm. you might just have to be just patient Mm -hmm. uh, while these things take place, you know? Yeah, I mean, in terms of, of um, whatever the time plan that you guys have, as you were mentioning, schools that are on the docket for either upgrades or those kinds of things uh, would be helpful, um, you know, for that to, to be rolled out or for the public to know that it's coming or, or the, the kinds of things that are in a particular school. Here's what we have. The other thing, too, that I wanted to ask is in terms of of uh, active shooter training, uh, how you do that with our students and our teachers. Is that something that we do? Uh, obviously, we have tornado drills. We have a variety of different things that we that we do within our schools, right? Well, I think, first of all, the word active shooter uh, in, in schools is overused word. It's a very rare event. Uh, we do uh, emergency drills, lockdown drills. Okay. Uh, that is not, it's focused around safety, overall safety. Uh, although it is, uh, it covers uh, an active assailant, um, it is not a, a primary focus because we realize that is a rare event. Uh, we're focused on the actual emergencies that have and will happen in our community. And though our staff is very prepared to deal with an active, uh, active assailant, uh, because that is the correct word, active assailant, not active shooter. Uh, but the, if we work with the active assailant, we're confident that our staff and the work we've done with the Grand Rapids Police Department, Michigan State Police, and the Kent County Sheriff Department, that we will be in good position, a very good position to keep our kids safe. I think that's good that you're not saying active shooter. That 
Just such a yeah, scary. Yeah. Yeah. There's lots of other things that, that can happen. Kids. Yes, I think it's an over over has a, definitely an overused word, and I think we put too much focus on active shooters and not enough focus on relationship building in our schools and the things that can actually happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm more concerned about a kid crossing the street uh, today than I am about yeah. an active assailant coming to our school. I do have one more question. Maybe you answered it and I didn't get it, but are there any places in the district now that have cameras that do record what's going on? Absolutely. Okay. Every one of our high schools okay. um, and all of our uh, all of our middle schools and our K-8s, uh, most of our K-8s, uh, but not all, about half of our K-8s are in the, in the uh, been in uh, the camera. Uh, we've had cameras in those buildings for well over 10 years. Okay. And so we're now coming around with the, with again, to be able to install in our elementary. We never thought it was needed in our elementary buildings, but I think documentation of behaviors is very important to parents, so we want to do that. Mm -hmm. And these uh, concerns that these parents expressed last night, it, we aren't going to put them in teachers' classrooms no matter what, so. Uh, we, we never, we've never placed cameras in classrooms. Um, that is a, uh, there, there's a lot of uh, legalities, uh, legal issues around cameras in classrooms, as well as bargaining units, uh, bargaining right. units that would have some, uh, mm -hmm. would probably have some severe pushback in that. Uh, me, I'm personally, I'll, I'll put them anywhere that the, that the law will allow, mm -hmm. uh, because I think uh, not only for our staff, it protects our staff, but it also gives uh, gives parents a clear picture of what their child mm -hmm. has uh, has done. Mm -hmm. but many, many times, and just uh, based on one of the comments, uh, many times uh, we see there are there are two sides of every story, mm -hmm. and oftentimes uh, we don't know the full side of what mm -hmm. what actually happened. We talked about, I believe, last night. I heard uh, independent investigation mentioned on several occasions, mm -hmm. where every every investigation uh, of a serious nature has an independent investigator, and that is the Grand Rapids Police Department. Okay. So th sure. these <laughs> incidents have uh, that we've Absolutely. heard about, yeah. Absolutely. I thought that that was the case, but we're not allowed to say anything. Yep. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, um, one of the, for Mr. Johnson, goes, uh, if it, I think the process is, if you want this report moved to the full board, that would be a decision that you would make with the board president. And then we will follow up with getting as many of these documents up in this presentation on the internet. John, do you think that Mr. Johnson should come to the next board meeting? I, I think so. I, I, think, I think it's critical. So for example, looking at, at some of these pieces. Um, no, I agree. I agree. Yeah. And how we are instituting them. I mean, this is really general. I don't know. So is this list actually happening at every school? The com components of a safe school yeah. is happening at every school in our district. Our, our principals have embraced this for many years. Uh, principals attend the uh, Principals Leadership Academy several times a year. Uh, so all of our principals have been trained on the components. All of our staff have been embraced and, tra and trained on the components of a safe school. The components of a safe school, although we've expanded, has been in practice in this district for over 20 years. I think that would be good for Because again, I think, I think you know, a lot of parents get bits and pieces, mm -hmm. and, and certainly our communities, and when, when things happen, whether it's a fight or whatever, you know, information goes out. But, but really, again, for our public to be able to understand, hey, this is what we practice, and this is how we train our staff, uh, our students go through particular things that allow them to, uh, if if they need to respond to something, um, most likely they're going to know how to do that because staff know how to do that and, and run them through whatever happens, whether it's a tornado drill or whether it's something else. And then just understanding, you know, not all our, of our restorative practices are in every one of our schools, Right. That would be something uh, Mr. McMurray can yeah. speak on because uh, we don't uh, we don't directly do restorative practices as we don't lead that training. Right. Uh, Mr. Yeah. McMurray and his team leads okay. that training. Yeah. And I'll so yeah, I do speak. think it would be helpful yeah. to be able to talk about those things uh, at a board meeting and for the and general public look, to understand. It would like like we are responding to some of the comments that were made last night, yeah. and, and we have taken this seriously, and that we want you here at a board meeting to. Uh, um, tell people like, you know, maybe they don't want to believe it, but this is what we do because last night when they were saying these things, I mean, I remember reading the story and I remember reading that 
the police had investigated, so I thought, who do you want besides the police? But the FBI, maybe, or something. <laughs> Put the FBI in our schools, please. <laughs> that's that next. That's next. That's next. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank right. you very much. Perfect. As always, <laughs> have a good day. Yep. Good morning, board members. Good morning. Typically, um, Natasha Neal, um, who is uh, the Director of Community and Student Affairs, she typically um, has this presentation uh, for you all. But like we mentioned earlier, she is uh, participating in our senior day. She's uh, the lead um, on that. So uh, she's participating in that. So she asked me to come and just have a conversation with you all um, about one component of our social emotional uh, learning strategies that we implement in the district. Um, just to introduce myself to you all, I am Paris McMurray. Um, I've been with the district for whew, maybe 10 years now, nine and a half, somewhere in there. So it's been a little while. So I've had you know the opportunity to work in different capacities. So I definitely appreciate this opportunity to have this conversation with you all today. Right. Um, so I'll be uh, briefly speaking about restorative practices, um, kind of giving you all a brief overview of the trainings that we take our staff and our students through. Um, you will be able to see a few things, um, you know, within this presentation as to how it impacts each one of our stakeholders um, within our educational community. So hopefully today um, you'll be able to understand an overview of social emotional learning. Um, you'll be able to see just a brief snapshot of restorative practices and some of the components and the foundational principles uh, that exist within restorative practices. Understand how Grand Rapids Public Schools, how it works. Um, within our schools. Um, I know, uh, Reverend Matias, you mentioned how does is it in every school? And I'll mention, you know, the schools specifically um, that it is currently implemented in. Um, and then I'll go into kind of a plan and how we'll make sure that it gets in each one of our schools that we have. Um, and then lastly, understand how restorative practices will continue to be implemented um, throughout our district. All right. So uh, in to start, um, social emotional learning, why is it important to us? Um, in GRPS, we believe that building strong, positive communities um, where students are seen and valued, um, that's a very important key um, in this statement, seen and valued, because a lot of times when the student comes to school, uh, they are expected to follow the expectations, get in line with the rules, be quiet, and continue to move on. Um, but restorative practices and social emotional learning really puts an emphasis on the relationship building um, with students, between staff and students, and between student and students as well, um, because we understand that not only is the um, culture centered around how staff and students interact, but mainly around how students interact with each other as well. When we have a healthy um, relationship between all stakeholders within the school, um, that's when learning takes place. Um, that's when positive culture um, around academic success takes place. And what we're, what we're seeing in most of our schools where that is happening, we're seeing um, scores increase. We're seeing, seeing student achievement increase. Um, we're seeing negative student data decrease, suspension data, truancy information, et cetera. Um, so we're noticing a lot of, um, a lot of improvement simply because uh, social emotional learning is now being really implemented into our schools. So in GRPS, we've chosen to begin um, our SEL implementation by increasing the intensity and fidelity of our restorative practices initiative. Um, restorative practices is an SEL praxis that teaches empathy, communication, self-awareness, social awareness, and relationship building. Um, community building circles are a great way to build relationship um, and create positive community within the classroom. And so to get into restorative practices, um, just to give a brief um, background and history of what it is, um, originated in the criminal justice system. Um, it looks to restore uh, the harm that was done between that individual um, and in that community. Um, in one of our trainings, we show a video um, of where a mother lost her son um, and, and the, um, the person, the, the the person who killed her son, unfortunately, had a conversation and she went actually to the jail, had a visit, um, and it was facilitated by some trained professionals, um, trained in restorative practices. 
um, restorative justice is what they called it um, originally. And they had that conversation. And what they came from that it was that there was a lot of healing that took place um, in that meeting and in that conversation. So then, you know, a few years ago, uh, the schools began to look at that system and see how we can implement that within our schools. Um, and what we're finding is that when we do have conflict between students, um, that repair of the harm really gets to the root of the issue um, and really sees, you know, what was the cause of that conflict? Because before, and unfortunately with social media now, you'll see a Facebook post here, you'll see a Snapchat post here, you'll see Instagram post here, and then that's all that we have to see where that conflict lives. But it's never an opportunity for the two young people or the staff and the student to get together and have a conversation. And that's one of the main goals around restorative practices so that the um, that the victim and the alleged uh, assaulting or assailant, if you will, um, has an opportunity to have that conversation with each other. Um, it gives all parties um, a voice in the process. Uh, there is a list of questions and conversation starters um, that it has, and I apologize that I do not have any of the restorative practices cards with you um, to give you, um, and I can provide that to you all um, as well, just, just so that you can have it. And what it does is, is those questions doesn't ask specifically uh, what was done, what did you do, but it really asked how were you affected by the incident that occurred? Who else was affected by the incident that occurred? And they're labeled and called restorative questions. And so it, it really facilitates that conversation um, amongst the, the parties involved so that it, do, it doesn't turn into a blaming, finger pointing session, but it really turns into a restorative healing uh, part, portion of the uh, conversation. Um, it works to develop community and manage conflict, and it separates the deed or what was done from the doer. That would um, be hard. Yeah. It is, right? It, it, it's very hard um, to understand that dynamic, especially for um, staff members who, who sees, sees a student running in the hallway, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Immediately, hey, quit running in the hallway. And so, and I'll get into effective statements more, um, but then this restorative practices training trains us as staff members to say, I really don't like when you run in the hallway. I'm afraid that you may hurt yourself. It damages your safety or whatever, right? And so being able to stop and think about how we respond to something as small as running in the hallway to maybe a fight that may occur in the cafeteria, right? Because we know that those behaviors um, exist in school. Mm -hmm. And so uh, adapting this paradigm to all behaviors, all conflict, all things that exist um, within the school building, really make sure that we're dealing with it and not just dispensing discipline for it. And that, I think that's something that's important. Mm -hmm. So if you look at um, how we approach, and this is um, goes into a little bit of what I was saying, a traditional approach focuses on the past, um, but a restorative approach focuses on the past, present, and the future. So it looks at the entire picture um, of an incident that may have occurred. Um, the traditional approach is preoccupied uh, with blame, blaming someone for what they did or what they did not do. Um, but the restorative approach emphasizes um, healing. All right, understand that this happened, but how can we move forward from this? Um, and lastly is a deterrence uh, linked to punishment, um, but this deterrence is linked to relationship and personal accountability. Um, so instead of suspending two students for fighting, right, maybe look at how can we build their relationship so that they don't fight anymore, so that they may become if not friends, at least acquaintances in school, where they can walk by and smile at each other, right? As they're walking to class. Or at together. least walk by without any damage. At least walk by, right? Yeah, that, that's, that's important. And have to smile. Exactly, exactly. So, so that's why there's a strong emphasis on that relationship piece um, between those two students, because unfortunately you'll get all of this outside noise that exists, like I mentioned with social media, et cetera, um, and really get to the root of the issue and the root of the conflict between those two students or between those two staff members um, or staff and students whatever relationship exists um, within the school building. So um, restorative practices is a continuum and it goes from formal all the way, uh, it goes from informal all the way to formal. Um, informal uh, are our effective statements. What I was mentioning about the example running in the hallway, as opposed to you know, blaming the student or blaming whoever stopped running in the hallway, take a, take a second and think about how it affects you that student running in the hallway. Mm -hmm. And they may be more receptive to understanding, especially if I have a great relationship with Ms. Slade, I don't want to disappoint Ms. Slade anymore. Mm -hmm. So if Ms. Slade asks me, hey, 
it hurts me when I run in the hallway. I know the next time I see Miss Slade, I'm gonna stop, slow down, and walk, right? <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I know that, that that's a very, very simple conversation or a very simple example, yeah. um, but that type of thinking and conversation really has a significant impact and shows the student, the staff member, that you're interested more in the relationship with that person as opposed to what that person is doing. There and again, one of the principles separating the deed from the doer. Right. Um, the restorative questions, like I mentioned, uh, the restorative questions in nature all ask, how can we heal from this process? We understand what happened. We understand the discipline that may have occurred. But how can we move forward um, in this particular incident? Um, small impromptu conferences. Um, this exists when there is conflict. Um, between two students. A teacher may have a moment coming in from a recess or coming in from a transition and understand that, you know, Johnny and Maxwell may have gotten into something at lunch or may have gotten into something at recess. Taking a quick two, three minutes and having a conversation, hey, I understand that this happened. How did you feel about it? How did you feel about it? And really getting the voice um, from each one of the students so that we can quickly move past whatever conflict that was so that we can get to the learning, get inside of the classroom. Right. Um, with our circles, our circles are um, for our community building sessions. Um, we will see examples of circles with um, dealing with conflict within a circle. So you will have a facilitator who facilitates a conversation amongst, say, a group of students who may be in conflict with each other. Um, and, and, and I'm going to mention specific schools because I've gotten permission from those administrators and everything like that to use them as examples because these are moments of success that I think that you all need to know about and we need to celebrate. Um, there was a situation at Innovation Central High School where there was a group of young ladies who had conflicts with each other, but it was based upon family conflict that had existed for at least 10 years, and it was around children, it was around um, uh, uh, husband-wife relationships. And so these young people were just in the mix of this conflict that existed, and so they were they were expressing that there at school. And so what we did was is we had a conversation. We brought each party in. Um, we had different staff members who, who did interventions with each one of the students. There was an administrator there. Um, there was a security officer there um, from Mr. Johnson's department. He was there in the school. Um, there, youth, there were youth advocates a part of that conversation as well. And what we did was is we just gave each person an opportunity to say how that particular incident or how that conflict um, affected them. Um, the staff member was able to say, you know, I've been working with you since you've been a freshman in high school. I've noticed your grades increase and decline. I've seen you as you've gotten older, mature. I was so hurt at the fact that you got involved in this conflict. And so that so that the, the student heard that and felt that and was able to kind of sit in that. Since then, since we had that conversation in that circle, um, the young ladies have not had any conflict at all. As a matter of fact, I checked in with the assistant principal there um, just to kind of do a check to make sure that this stuff is working, right? Um, haven't had any conflict um, with each other. As a matter of fact, when we shifted our conversation from the conflict to now academic success, and so we were able to attach the young ladies who weren't um, connected to anyone in the building as far as a staff member, uh, one of our youth advocates and the counselors. Um, their grades have improved. Um, their number of missing assignments has decreased drastically. Um, and, and so we started with conflict. But when we focused on the relationship between staff and students, between student and students, then we were able to get to some of that academic success. And we see concrete numbers from an individual student um, that shows that this process works, right? Um, and then lastly, a formal conference or mediation, that's where there's some serious harm that has been done. Um, I'm you know, one of the disciplinary hearing officers, and so I um, work with families who, whose students are uh, recommended for a long-term suspension or for an expulsion. And you know, because of a violation of a state law or violation of a public act of some sort. And so in those conferences, we have conversations around what happened, who was affected by what happened, um, and then what resources can we connect the family to so that that student does not you know, return back. And so some of what Mr. Johnson was speaking to a little earlier, um, as far as recommending them to go to the team class on Saturdays, what we're finding is, is those students get so much rich content and 
information. And there is a parent portion of that team class on Saturdays as well. The family is now able to have a conversation when they go home. Hey, this is what we learned in team on this day. Um, let's try to implement it there. And what, we, what we've been able to see is students who have been recommended or have served a long-term suspension, the likelihood of them returning back to that point um, is very, very low because of the conference that we had and the ability to connect them to the different resources out in the community. All right. I know it's a lot of information. Do you all have any questions at this point? What are those resources that you connect them to? So the resources that we connect them to, um, we work with Network 180. We work with Arbor Circle. Um, we work with different counseling agencies um, within our uh, community. Uh, we work with an agency um, through Bethany Christian Services. It's called the Grand Rapids Center for Transformational Change. I feel like I have to take a quiz on that every morning just to try to remember it, right? And so what those, um, what those organizations do is they provide a couple of different things for us. One, counseling services um, for our students. We understand that behavior is sometimes an expression of something that has hurt right. or something okay. that has been done to them in the past right. or just an expression of something that they may need, but they may not know how to express, hey, I need this, mm -hmm. right? And so what the counseling does is that it gives them an opportunity um, to express some of those things and really learn more about themselves as a student. Um, there are times where we recommend family counseling um, so that that student feels the support uh, from his parents or her parents um, so that they can really know and understand that we really want some change. We don't want you to get in trouble anymore. Um, so that's one of the services that we provide, um, that we connect our students with. Um, Arbor Circle has what's called a day youth program. And what it is, it's a six week course um, that emphasizes um, strength, leadership, skill building, um, and group kind of therapy sessions, if you will. They have a component of community service learning where they partner with um, different nonprofit organizations within the uh, community. I know United Methodist Community House is one of the organizations that they connect with, and they simply go and play bingo with the senior community there. Um, they will volunteer in some of, the, uh, some of the daycare rooms. They don't work directly with the young people that are in the daycare, um, but as far as helping the teachers with uh, printing papers or doing something around right the classroom, um, to kind of help with that. And what that does is, is that kind of gives them ownership um, to help them become productive citizens. That's one of our pillars here in GRPS that we, you know, help our students become productive yeah. citizens. And so what we do is give them that opportunity. So if there has been a harm that has existed, a behavior that has existed within school, how can we teach them through service in the community, um, through connecting with leadership skill building um, so that we can impact their lives on a more positive level? Now that day youth program is when they are when they're suspended mm -hmm. and they have to do yes um, they have to meet a, a counseling criteria yes in order to be uh, then allowed to come back right into the school exactly typically um, mm -hmm. we require at least five counseling sessions we know that five sessions does not get to it at all. But what we don't want to have happen is we require 15, 20 sessions and that student is continually out of school. Mm -hmm. um, what, we, what we've tried to do, the state of Michigan has given us um, specific uh, definitions of long-term suspension versus expulsion. Um, the long-term suspension is defined as any out of school placement from 11 to 59 school days. If a school recommends a long-term suspension, we look to try to do as less as we possibly can, right? As far as the number of days out mm -hmm. um, and really inundate them with those resources, the day program, et cetera. So what we'll do a lot of times is we'll provide enough amount of time for the parents to get that student enrolled into counseling at least. And so when they are reinstated mm -hmm. back in the school, we have a relationship between the school and the counseling agency. So we can say, what is the counselor working on? How can imp it impact our teachers <coughs> and our staff members in the building so that we can help that student be successful? How effective is it? We're seeing that it is effective, right? Um, to give you a number, uh, I don't have a specific number to give you. Um, I can give you a specific student. Um, I won't uh, um, give, give her name at this point, um, but she went through uh, the five counseling sessions. And at the end of the session, she was reinstated back into school, went, went back to school, um, got reinstated and everything like that. But she reached out to our office and said, hey, um, I'm doing okay in school, 
but I still think I need to talk about some things. Mm -hmm. And so we brought her um, back in with her parents and say, hey, mom, she reached out to us um, with this. Can we connect you all back again? And mom was in full support of it. Um, and so we were able to connect that student um, back to the counseling sessions. And so it provided her an opportunity to identify that, hey, I, I still have some more things that I need to talk through and talk with. Her behavior decreased, right? That's, you know, that's the ideal goal. Right. But really, it kind of helped her become more of a whole person, if you will. And I'm assuming that all of these counseling sessions and so on are things that are offered to parents without cost. If, if they work with insurance, um, yeah. our, our schools that have KSSN um, in the schools, we are able to provide that service for them. Um, but Network 180, Arbor Circle, um, they work with uh, insurance companies. Um, the, youth pro the youth day program um, does not require a cost at all. So that is free of charge for them. So if we want to just um, uh, uh, refer them right to that, we can do that as well. Mm -hmm. And so to continue on, and I apologize that it's taking a while, um, this uh, social discipline window, this is one of the principles that we um, uh, train our staff with, um, just looking at where you fall um, within this social discipline window. Two, meaning, th meaning it, it goes from a spectrum of high control to low control, low support to high support. And what you'll see in the highlighted uh, box is the restorative box. We want to have a mix of high control and high support. We don't want to do things to students or to individuals. We don't want to do things for individuals. And we don't want to ignore whatever may happen. But we want to figure out a way to work with that particular person um, so that we can get to that um, achievable behavior, that achievable academic success, or simply that achievable decision to work with that particular student um, to help them through that. So what we do is we um, take staff members through. Uh, we give them a scenario. Um, picking what to, what what you like to eat for dinner, and we give them a, based upon their um, personality where they would fall within the social discipline window, and so we make it practical for them, and then we teach them kind of the nuts and bolts around restorative practices and, and the definitions um, around that. So I wanted to show you all some specific data um, around restorative practices and the implementation of that. Um, this is um, some suspension data, and I apologize if it's cut there. You can see it um, back there. But this is some uh, discipline data from uh, the 2015-16 school year all the way to the 2018-19 um, school year. At this point, I'll start in 2016-17. At this point in the 16-17 school year, Campus Elementary School had 84 suspensions. Right, way too high. What was today's date? November the 20th, right? Yeah. Way too high. And at this point, this is where they were. Um, in that year, the following year, over that summer, the principal really saw this and took a charge to say, we need to figure something out. And so what he did was, is he connected with our, um, our SEL coordinators, our team um, within our district. I need help. What do we do? And so restorative practices was one of the things he took his staff members through an intense training over the summer um, where they went in, uh, got the training, got information, uh, tore down some of their uh, some of their outside judgments that that could have existed. And it really gave them an opportunity to look at, OK, how can we make this better? Because this 84 number is way too high. And so the next year. Um, after they implemented those restorative practices, the number November 20th, 2017, 18 school year, 17 suspensions. And as of yesterday, they're only at three suspensions this year. So now we have an elementary school, a pre-K through five, um, I think 350 to 400 students somewhere in there, and only three suspensions this school year, right? And those three suspensions were only because um, they were violent in nature, and um, the other person got hurt, uh, right? Mm -hmm. That's the only reason that those suspensions existed. So, so the 84 number represents defiance, represents disrespect, represents running in the hallway, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so we, exactly, Ms. Yeah, Slade, like, right? We're so still doing that. We're still doing that, right? And so, and so the school- years later, we're still giving stuff <laughs> exactly, running right? in the hallway. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And, and, so, and so what the yeah. staff members did is was that they took away that, that response of, you're, you're running in the hallway, 
get out, right? right? right. And how to deal with it in a different way. Um, there's a student that, I, that I'm gonna highlight um, later on, as a matter of fact, on this next slide. Um, this, is, this is just a responses to restorative practices. Um, and I wanna hi highlight this fourth grade student on the bottom uh, under the GRPS staff and students having a problem uh, with one of his friends. And he went to the principal, hey, hey, listen, 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 we need to do a circle right now because he get on my nerves. <laughs> and so that's how he said it, right? And, 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 that, and that's how he presented it. Um, and so not only is the staff understanding the power of restorative circles and restorative practices, but we also have our students who are now on a practical level. I got a problem with you. You got a problem with me. Let's talk about it. So they've got As a tool a, to deal with it. They have a tool to deal with it now, right? And that's early. That's all the way in elementary school. So just imagine as they go through middle and high school, right? How much able, how much more able they be able to articulate what they're feeling, articulate the conflict that exists. So if we can teach these things all the way in, in elementary school, then you know our high schools will, will definitely thrive. That's be a relief for kids. Absolutely, you right? know, because now I've got a way other than fighting or whatever. Exactly, because they don't like to do that either. Exactly, definitely not. Yeah, definitely not. And so, um, what what this what this slide highlights is just um, it highlights a principal. It highlights a high school youth advocate. Highlights the fourth grade student that we mentioned. Um, highlights a grandfather that I participated in a restorative circle with um, with his grandson. And then it highlights a community therapist through one of the um, counseling mm -hmm. services. And so what it does, it just gives you an example of how they respond, how they feel um, around restorative practices, um, and how it how positive and powerful <clears throat> it is within our schools. It'd be interesting to see what kind of impact that has on special ed referrals. I taught, Absolutely. I taught Absolutely. EI kids, and, and a okay. lot of that was a reaction to, and then it keeps going until Continued they on. refer them to special. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And right. understandably, I mean, they're by that time. Yeah, for sure. Problem. But I'd be interesting to see if re restorative practice, or maybe there is research on it, has that impacted and, some of that. And so I don't know the data behind that, mm -hmm. but I can tell you um, that at manifestation determination reviews, MDRs right. after incidents right. that right. have occurred, we've been able to add a component of a restorative circle with the family there, with um, social workers there, with all the special ed staff there, so that we can we, so we, we can in integrate this process into that MDR process as well. Right. And so we're able to kind of connect that student with more resources there within the school. Very good. Yeah. Um, and finally, yes, yeah, a lot, right? And finally, just the plan of action. Um, there is a, implementing a restorative practices. There's a team of certified um, restorative practices trainers, um, been trained through restorative practices, um, a university or institute um, based out of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Um, there have been a number of us who have gone um, and been trained to. We've been actually trained to train trainers, if you will. Um, that team exists of SEO coordinators, youth advocates, security officers, um, and hearing officers. And the reason why there are so many different staff is because we want to get a variety of lenses um, so, that, so that staff members, teachers, et cetera, can get an idea of how this particular person or this particular department interacts with restorative practices. Mm -hmm. um, building based staff meetings, um, as a matter of fact, I think I, I just got an email from a staff member saying, hey, can, uh, from a principal saying, can you come in on one of our Monday uh, staff meetings and just do a training? So they wanna take their whole hour and a half and do simply restorative practices trainings, teaching circles in particular, um, because uh, restorative circles really help with classroom culture and climate. And a lot of teachers, what we're finding is adding that into um, their overall um, classroom management plan. And it's really um, seeing some significant boost there. Um, peer mediation, Union High School, um, their counseling department went through the training. And what they're going to do is they're going to then parcel this down to their students so that they can create a peer mediation type group to deal with peer-to-peer -peer conflict, if you will. Um, our parents are connected to this as well. Um, uh, there are three uh, classes in particular that we provide through our parent university um, that deal specifically with restorative practices, helping students imagine um, resolving conflict and teaming with teachers. Um, I know that's a lot of information um, and a lot of things that I've dumped all on you all at once, but do you have any questions at this point? Just well, check the, the number of referrals to special ed when you're done with it. I will do that. Yeah, I, I mean, will do that. Because I, I will make you a wager Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> That'll make a difference. Right. Yeah, it definitely would. You're now, right can that. you tell us what schools are using? 
I can. This practice? Right now, um, schools that have staff trained or are um, using it, Ottawa Hills High School, Alger Middle School, Riverside Middle School, uh, Sherwood Global Studies Academy, Westwood Middle School, Campus Elementary School, East Leonard, um, Burton Elementary, um, and then Burton Middle School is just requested um, training for that. So they're they're in the works for that. Um, and then Southwest Community Campus um, has restorative practices there as well. Good. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to get it up to all. Everybody, okay. everybody, all the way through. And as, as a matter of fact, I did not add um, mm -hmm. CA Frost Environmental Academy. Um, they Their staff was trained at the beginning of the year. Um, and so they're in the early stages of, uh, of implementing restorative practices within the classroom and without, within the building as mm -hmm. a whole. Great. Yeah. We really need to see that in black and white. Okay. You know, that list that, that you gave us, it's, it's nice. The list of schools? Us, the list of schools. Okay. Um, because we don't have that anywhere. Where could we refer that to and say, hey, th this, is, this is where we started uh, for at least the five and a half years that I've served. We've been in pilot mode uh, in terms of restorative justice. We need to move beyond that and say, this is a standard that our district believes, if that's what, we're, if that's what you're proposing and if that's where we're heading and if that's what the board is approving, we need to know that plan. Um, um, so that um, uh, our parents, and I like what you guys are doing with providing um, um, the parent portion through parent university. Mm -hmm. Hey, the, these are critical things that you need to know uh, and that, that you can be involved in because you can take this home with you. Mm -hmm. You can practice this at home right. and it's mirrored, uh, certainly it's mirrored in school and now it's mirrored at home. And, and, and they know how to do that. And in fact, as parents, hey, we need to have a huddle too. We need mm -hmm. to have a circle because we're having conflicts mm -hmm. and, and whatever that looks like okay. or however that manifests itself. Yeah. But we really need, um, we need to know that. The other is some of the data. So I'm assuming that you're using Swiss data to get at some of the, uh, um, some of the things that kids are doing, running in the hallways and, and so forth that are really saying, well, we're having these kinds of issues at our particular school, Burton, whatever it is, Ottawa. Um, we're having gang problems. We're having relationship problems. Uh, how do we know that? Uh, obviously, it, it happens. But then th we have Swiss data that tells us, mm -hmm. second hour, at this, this happened. Sorry. Uh, and based on that, I'm assuming that your principals then are saying, we got some issues. Mm -hmm. How do we solve this? Yeah, um, and obviously they're looking to the district, you guys, to say to give us give us some help, and 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 you were alluding to that. Mm -hmm. Principals are inviting us to come, share with us. We mm -hmm. we had this period of time. I know that at, at Westwood, some of the teachers started using restorative practice, uh, exactly what you're saying, as part of their classroom management, because they were having conflicts with other students within a particular hour. And it's like, what do we do? Well, John, being a community school coordinator at the time, hey, we can do, we can do a circle because they were, they were headed that way. And that was really helpful to resolve you know, a specific issue at a specific hour with some students and they had some tools mm -hmm. and, 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 and so forth. So, so uh, again, for us as the academic committee, I think what, what we want to know is, is how, how are we implementing this? And, and how is this, um, this, this pebble effect uh, uh, happening in our district? And, and how, you know, who's next to get this training? Or, and what does it cost um, the, the schools to have that? If, if we have trainers or trainers trained, mm -hmm. then are we ready to then implement this district-wide where we can really say, hey, with, by 2023, we see our 54 schools uh, utilizing this and however particular ways it, it, it you know, it, it's gonna happen there or it's gonna um, uh, show itself in particular schools. Um, it's exciting to see that we're doing that. It's nice to see community partners, Network 180, Arbor Circle, Bethany, certainly KSSN and, and others that are within our schools 
that really uh, get tied into that restorative practice piece mm -hmm. and can and can help us or you all continue mm -hmm. those you know those pieces of of uh, of training staff and then our parents too a lot of times they hear the conflict but they don't always they don't always see the solution that right. was said unless their kid says hey by the way mom this happened in my fifth hour class mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely. They never tell mom though. But again, I'm I'm a big proponent that every school needs to have that in their website so that parents can go to it and see it and, and look at it for themselves and see what this practice is and know that my school is my kid's school is practicing this and um and and to avail themselves. Obviously if they don't, that's their issue. Right. You know. But at least we can say, hey, did you did you look at our website? Did you see what our core beliefs are about discipline, about you know preparing your child holistically or whatever it is that, that we do, so that our our parents uh, have resources uh, at their fingertips? And certainly, you know these times and dates that the PTCCs are saying, hey, we're going to have this available to you. Mm -hmm. Come. Right. And again, if if they choose not to, right. You know, it it, it that it's on them. the opportunity though. It's on them, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, too, that didn't um, Mel Atkins tell us, too, that they have these, this program where I know he identified certain areas in school that were having a problem, a lot of problems that were happening at lunchtime. They took a look at it, and they were able to figure out just from the data that we have that, uh, you know, just a, a few little things. I, I remember they, they changed recess or something like that, and it solved the problem. Mm -hmm. Or they put more people out on recess so that you know the kids didn't have a chance to get. So those those pieces of information are available to to you, or maybe to us. Not names of people, but the fact that incidents mm -hmm. happen and where they're happening and how we're working on addressing those. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the other is is that um, in terms of social emotional learning, help us understand the total picture because you just told us that mm -hmm. this is one this is one piece mm -hmm. board yep. this is one piece that we're doing and now help us see the the yes. pie so that will be natasha neal okay and um we have asked her to uh be present uh, uh in december um, i think that probably um we had a conflict in schedule because right. of our mm -hmm. senior day Mm -hmm. But and I that, think it probably worked out best because it would have been more than we could handle. In this mm -hmm. I think time. that we won't have a meeting next month because okay. it's the same time as the retreat. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Oh, that's true. So it's going to be changed or okay. Yeah. So the academic committee will either be. Okay. So I'll work with her to get her on mm -hmm. schedule. Yeah. Okay. Because we probably won't, this committee probably won't meet again until January. So. Yeah. So we'll be following up on schedules because, yeah, I remember <laughs> seeing that. that we're trying to squeeze a ton of stuff in. Right, yeah. So okay, before I leave. Yeah, that's yes, right. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We need your Schedule wisdom. Schedule as many <laughs> meetings as possible. <laughs> this is this is exciting because um, you know, our community and 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 unfortunately I wasn't here yesterday, but you know, obviously they're asking a lot of a lot of good questions, a lot of concerns. And there's a lot of good solutions that we have and that are that we're practicing already. I think I would know. Yeah, and, and, and our public, and oftentimes, one of the few times will be at a board meeting that they actually get that, and then they see it, oh, man, that's right, we're doing that. Yeah. Um, and then hopefully, um, you know, principals get a chance to spread that word in terms of, of their specific community that they're serving right. and families and, and, and kids right. and our, our students. But this is really exciting to see uh, the progress that's being made and the expansion, expansion that you guys are doing it's it's nice to hear the number of schools i yeah. just want to see that yeah so yes. that we can so that we can praise that and, and yeah say and these the are the kinds of things that i think should be presented at a board meeting so that the people who come and have issues can see that you know because like we just sit up here and we're not allowed to respond to anything but if they're given all of this information mm -hmm. at a general board meeting you know there's no one from the public here right this minute but if we had it at a general board meeting and the people who come and have, you know, complaints because last night when the people were concerned about having a outside investigation, if we had 
already heard from, you know, from um, Larry Johnson that, you know, all of these things, you know, we just don't cover it up. We call the police, you know, these kinds of things, that they know that this is happening. It may not, you know, like with anything else, it may not work out the way you want it to work out, but, sure. you know, things ha are being done. And, you know, since we're not allowed to respond, if we are up front and presenting it at a meeting. That's a good idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, something on that order to uh, get it out in front of the community. and That we're doing a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, the and public doesn't know that. Right. No, they you do know, not. They just no. hear a problem. They don't know no. that X is happening all mm -hmm. over or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And really, the you know the statistics that you showed that you showed us for is it C for us campus campus I'm, I'm sure. sorry, mm -hmm. man, what a great example yeah. of Major. of you you can you can see what happens when it was right. implemented exactly and certainly the environment itself for sure it's a healthy yeah. environment kids kids is that feel fairly safe. typical <clears throat> is that fairly it is typical, typical. I, I can think of um, you know to name specific schools right so we can have some concrete information Riverside Middle School their numbers look exactly the same. Um, because um, they, they even have a staff that it's only their responsibility to conduct restorative meetings and restorative circles. Mm -hmm. And so that conflict that they've been able to see where you had the high numbers last school year mm -hmm. and this year uh, significantly lower um, numbers around suspensions um, simply because of the restorative that has been implemented. And again, to know you know the, the staff that are assigned. Right, okay. Um, the, the youth advocates, and, I, sure. and I've seen them in action. Yeah. I mean, the... The, and, and our security guards too, the relationship that they build with these kids. Absolutely. Um, it, it, it's pretty awesome because they have a person that they can go to, to deal, to deal with it. Sometimes it's, it's, it's you know, uh, during a class time and, and, and so forth, but, but still it's, it's nice to know that you have a team of people mm -hmm. that really know this mm -hmm. and move kids towards Right. towards that reconciliation, towards those pieces that are so critical for them to learn, because as adults, they're going to they're gonna continually use that in exactly. the future. So. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Reverend right. Matias, do you think it would be appropriate that uh, we have, uh, we check with Wendy and see if we couldn't have something at some point, I know we have a lot going on, but at some point for the whole board to hear about this, mm -hmm. you know? I think that would be we, helpful. Yeah, because I when you get so. these telephone calls, mm -hmm. Yeah, and they only hear the other side. I listen patiently, but I don't mm -hmm. really know what's next. But uh, I think yeah, I I think so. To for you guys to be able to present some of this information and data and expand on it a little bit, and and also future, we're looking at at these pieces being ushered out, you know, in succession to whatever number of schools or, you know, the the kind of training and effort that it takes to make that happen. It's not just a snap. That's right. We, we have to because we have 52 schools yeah. and and they're continually growing and staff changes and all those things but mm -hmm. but just to be able for the for the board to know and the public to know that that the district is working at these at these issues because this is this is critical to our growth and and certainly our safety which is one of the pieces that a, a lot of parents when they move into communities how safe for the school because mm -hmm. I'm sending my kid there that kind of thing, so thank and you. And I think, too, that we have to make it clear that just because the suspension rates went down, that doesn't mean that we're just not kicking kids out. Exactly, that we're just, exactly. We're just overlooking right. the behavior so exactly. we don't kick them out. But exactly. The numbers reflect that we're keeping kids in the building, but what's <clears throat> happening to them in the building. So I think that would be really important for people mm -hmm. to understand that. Yes, and our, our board kids. policies reflect that value that we have. Right. So we're, we're not just kicking kids out, mm -hmm. we're, we're finding a way to keep them in right. um, and, and to help them mature and grow. And so, you know, I think I think our board policy reflects that that effort. Now, yeah. do we have in-school suspension so that kids who get in trouble in the middle of the day might go to a cool-off room and on the day? That some, the some, of, some of our schools, yeah, do utilize in-school suspension. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like the high schools? High schools, I know a few of the middle schools in particular, they do and utilize that. Yeah, yeah, much time. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, much time. Yeah. That time. Yeah. Middle schools need it more than Yeah, <laughs> probably. Yeah. Yeah. If I remember the middle school, right. which yeah. I did. You remember it correctly. I, I taught middle school types. <laughs> exactly. Emotionally impaired behavior. Okay, yes. okay. They're so all, I know that. They're all yeah, emotionally absolutely. impaired when That's they're teenagers. Right. So you can imagine when they're referred. <laughs> right. But they get. 
right, right, how right. bad they really are. Do we have any more <laughs> They're questions? not bad. They're just, no. Misbehaving. So we have three follow-up actions, um, Pastor Matias and the board. We um, will send you um, information from Paris regarding scaling up. And you have also asked Larry Johnson to send any information or data that he might have regarding uh, tracking the impact of the team program. Yeah. Uh, you have also asked for several documents to be uploaded to our internal internet system, including the list of schools uh, that are currently instituting or implementing the uh, restorative practices. Mm -hmm. So we'll upload those documents, including the cards that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Uh, the data, as soon as I get it from uh, Mr. McMurray mm -hmm. and Mr. Johnson, we will send directly to you. Yeah, that would be helpful. Thank you so much. And we'll work with uh, Dr. Fall and Superintendent Mule to see can have some reports at the board from mm -hmm. Thank you. Johnson. Right. Uh, I'll let the superintendent know. In the okay. Okay, good. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very you. much. Oh, very it. interesting. Thank Absolutely. you. And we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.